A new era for the X-Men begins when Cyclops and his team take up residence in an abandoned Sentinel factory in Alaska. Is Jed McKay's first issue the fresh take longtime X-Fans have been waiting for? Or is it more of the same? We're going to find out in our review of X-Men number one from Marvel Comics. See you in three. Much has been made in online discourse and comics journalism about Marvel's decision to end the Krakoan era in favor of a back-to-basics approach to the X-Titles. Optimistically, dubbed the From the Ashes era, new X-Title steward Tom Brevoort has the unenviable task of recasting the creative teams, reworking the titles, and forging a new path that puts the increasingly unpopular Krakoan phase of mutant history in the rearview mirror. Jet McKay has the equally unenviable task of being the first gladiator to step into the lion's den with artist Ryan Stegman. So here we are with the adjectiveless X-Men number one. Does the debut issue of the first of many titles make a bold statement about the future of the mutants at Marvel? Well, let's find out. We begin with Police Chief Paula Robbins of Merle, Alaska, pulling up to the metal doors of a manufacturing facility located about 20 minutes outside of the town. Chief Robbins knocks on the door in anticipation of a meeting that was pre-scheduled with Scott Summers, who is also known as Cyclops. Unfortunately, Cyclops is out on a mission with the fighting members of his team, so Hank McCoy, also known as Beast, steps in to give Chief Robbins the meet and greet to set her mind at ease, hopefully, and let her know that everything's okay, and to hopefully quell any fears that they have about mutants living next door to the town. Jed McKay starts the issue off with a sort of a low and slow approach. He creates this character named Chief Robbins and uses that character to act as the audience surrogate, so that way you can ask questions, react, and receives all kinds of exposition about what's going on with the X-Men and the new status quo. Chief Robbins accomplishes that mission, but readers who are hoping that the series would start off with a big bang, some kind of big wow moment to get you on board, are really going to be left with this sort of unsatisfied feeling that we're just going to easing on into it. Cut to the Marauder, and if you're a longtime X-Men fan, it's basically the updated version of the Blackbird. There we see Cyclops and the fighting members of the team quickly approaching the island nation of Santo Marco. Cyclops effortlessly directs team members to use their powers and various strategic moves to incapacitate and infiltrate an Orcus facility where his psychic mutants have detected six mutants in captivity. At some point in the recent past, Wolverine was sent in for surveillance, but he never came out. We never see that scene, don't know where it comes from, but we learn that Wolverine is on the island through some dialogue and parts of the communication between the different mutants. Here we get to see the team in action and sort of a sense of their broader purpose, which we now know is to find and rescue mutants so they can be brought back to the manufacturing facility in Alaska. Unfortunately, the rescue sequence is where we see the cracks in the foundation of McKay's X debut. Quentin Choir, also known as Kid Omega, is incredibly irritating which is part of his personality, but here the Twitter speak and the dialogue and his over-the-top personality reactions are just an immensely obnoxious levels. Even Magneto later on in the issue will quietly mention to himself that he's waiting for Quentin to be killed off so he doesn't have to deal with his obnoxious personality anymore. Magic and Juggernaut act like immature competitive siblings, which doesn't seem at all at in character for either one of those two individuals. And they're intellects are sort of cranked down. They're acting like meatheads, which is very strange. In addition, the interactions between the characters turns a little bit jokey at times when when you're in the middle of a high-tension, high-pressure combat scenario, which in some ways echoes the flat humor of MCU Phase 4, which is not at all what anybody wants out of this first issue. When we get to the high-paced action sequence, which is the rescue, which takes up the lion's share of the issue as far as in terms of action and adventure, it comes at the expense of the narrative flow. You see panels jumping from one to the next without much of a development or smooth transition that comes into really rapid fire. Uh, think of uh, like a big action sequence in, in a film, something like Indiana Jones or Star Wars, and have it sliced up and diced up and compressed into like a 60 second TikTok video. That's the kind of feeling you get here. You're really jumping around and the transitions aren't at all smooth. Yes, you have to be efficient with the page space. Yes, you have to not let things linger too long. We get that. But when you have to shortcut the big action sequence, which is the thing that's supposed to hook you, and it's lost due to the uh, neighborly tour that's given to Chief Robbins, that means editorial ever oversight should have kicked in and evened out how the different scenes are laid out here. The issue is imbalanced towards slow pace for Chief Robbins, fast pace for the action sequence, and it really feels uneven and imbalanced. Speaking of which, that brings us back to the tour. So Chief Robbins is moving around the facility, lamenting to Beast because the town 
is uneasy about the mutants moving in. Not just because they're taking up space nearby, but also we learn through the course of the tour that the facility used to be a Sentinel manufacturing facility. In effect, the, the building was designed to kill and hunt mutants. So even though Beast is listening with a, I would say a sympathetic ear, he is not completely bought into the whole idea of placating Chief Rob, and they both know it. The tour concludes with Chief Robbins then meeting Magneto, which turns into a mess. Not because there's an argument or anything like that, but he thoroughly turns on the anti-charm and lets Chief Robbins know that if you, if any of the townspeople come by and start trouble, he's going to deal with it in pretty brutal terms. So the whole, the whole concept of bringing Chief Robbins in to allay her fears and ease the minds of the town people pretty much goes out the window. The case interaction with Chief Robbins and Magneto has the desired effect of using Chief Robbins as the audience insert, also kind of letting the townspeople of Merle know that the, mut the mutants aren't anybody to be fooled with. But in a strange sort of negation type of reaction, the whole purpose of using Chief Robbins as the audience insert is sort of canceled out by the ending with her interaction with Magneto. What was the point of bringing her out? The whole idea for Scott to bring the chief out was to let them know that the mutants are maybe not safe, but they're not there to do any harm. That they that the townspeople can be assured that the mutants are not there to start trouble. They're not going to start hunting them. They're not going to do any of that. Why would Scott do that? <laughs> If he knows that Magneto is there, that the chief is going to show up at any time, that the interactions could turn out ugly or at least leave the chief feeling more afraid of the mutants rather than less afraid of the mutants. It, the whole thing is counterproductive and counterintuitive to what Scott was trying to accomplish, and it makes no sense. The issue switches back to the rescue scene, which is really now at the point where we get to the real big meat and potatoes of what's going to happen with this series going forward. It comes two-thirds of the way through the issue, but okay, we get there eventually. The X-Men battle what they find to be former Orcus agents who are now known as the Fourth School. And they are so named because they believe that they are the next stage of evolution for humanity, which is not just humanity, it's a combination of humanity, AI, which is the technological source that overthrew Orcus during the whole end of Krakoa era, and also mutant components. So now it's the all three now combined into a fourth new entity. Psylocke gets to Wolverine, frees him, and we learn through really quick sequence of events that Wolverine had been captured when he was sent in for surveillance and that they were, I think, pulling out his organs, letting them regrow and then pulling them out again. So they were basically creating a warehouse or a storehouse of organs from Wolverine, maybe, not quite sure because the art, we'll get to the art in a minute. And then Quentin detects that the other mutants that they received a psychic message from that they were there turned out to be the people that they were fighting which are sort of dressed in these modified aim costumes however the big moment if you want to call it that is they figure out that the mutants are just adult humans who have had their latent x genes activated further on down the line we see that there are two individuals who are talking from the shadows who are paying attention to the fight at least from a safe distance the way they refer to each other sounds like mother and daughter and they call themselves collectively 3k whatever that means and it looks like that they were responsible for adults that are now part of this fourth school having their latent mutant genes activated as the fight progresses it starts to tilt in the x-men's favor because apparently these fourth school new adult mutants have their powers but they haven't had a lifetime's worth of practice so the trained x-men team are starting to overcome them 3k observing this whole thing from the shadow says okay that's enough we've got the information we need looks like we've we're making progress on whatever it is they're trying to do so they sort of snap their fingers and everybody teleports away leaving the x-men alone just with wolverine the team heads back to the camp wolverine says i can't start over again and decides to go for a very long walk Beast and Cyclops debrief each other about the day's events and the folks of Merle get one last wow moment sort of splash page at the very end which I won't spoil as another form of intimidation to let them know that you know whatever they were doing related to Sentinels and Mutants it is far from over. What do we like about X-Men number one? Overall McKay gets the job done by establishing the new status quo of the team using some action to demonstrate the team's missions and their collective capabilities how they work together as a unit and you get a very brief introduction to the villain threat to come in this arc 
however long it lasts. If you're looking for at least covering the basics, getting those check boxes checked, this pretty much is it. So what's not so great about X-Men number one, well, unfortunately, there's a lot to nitpick here. Some of the nits are pretty big, some of them are not so big, but they all sort of stack on top of each other. This is one of those rare issues where the, it's the intangibles that really make the difference. Why on earth, and we talked about it earlier, but just to kind of put a very strong point on it, why on earth would Scott leave an open-ended invitation for Chief Robbins to come and visit the facility when he knows he possibly could not be there or when he knows he's not going to be away and you have folks like Glob and Zorn and Magneto just hanging around scaring the daylights out of Chief Robbins. The whole point of inviting her there is to let them know that everything is safe, everything is fine, and it doesn't make any sense. Scott is supposed to be the strategic mastermind of the team. Professor Xavier says it all the time, although he's not in the picture here. Beast even makes an explicit comment in this issue that Scott is maybe not a genius mastermind, but a strategic leader of the highest order. Why would he set them up to be at odds with the town when the whole point is to not have that happen. Next, the character work is just strange. It's bizarre. There's one panel or a sequence of scenes at the beginning of the mission where Magic and Juggernaut are doing this rock, paper, scissors move, and it's weird because they both come at each other like competitive siblings, very immature, and almost acting like meatheads. It's very strange. I don't know why it's there. It's unfunny, it's almost idiotic, and it's painfully out of character for both of them. And yeah, again, we're going to pick on Quentin Choir here. He is the type of character that you can only tolerate in small doses. He's obnoxious, he's over the top. To put him on as a regular member of the team and then take his personality and crank it up a few notches is just a horrible team choice character lineup misstep. You know you have chosen poorly when Magneto even has a small scene where he's saying, and I'm paraphrasing here, oh boy, not this guy again. When can we kill him off? Last but not least, uh, this is a foible that we've seen over and over again with Jen McKay on multiple titles. McKay is not great with creating, engaging, compelling villains. You see that full force here. You get the introduction of this very nebulously defined 3K, whatever that is. We don't know who they are. We don't know what they want don't know what motivates them. At best, you could say that they have tech that activates latent X genes in adults. And so, okay, great. Is that supposed to be a big deal? Well, why is that a problem? I mean, people are born with mutant abilities all the time in this universe. So why is it all of a sudden that activating mutant abilities in adults is somehow a threat of some sort? I mean, again, McKay struggles with doing compelling villains. And unfortunately for the first issue, he does that exact same thing here and that does not bode well for the future. So if you're listening to this or reading this and you're saying, wait a minute, yeah, stop being so picky. You gotta give it a chance. You have to let the story develop. There's, this is sort of a reboot. Not really, but it's a soft reboot. The answer is no, absolutely not. We're done with that. No more, give it a chance. No more, let the story settle in. We've given Marvel and DC umpteen number of chances over the past several years to do that. If Marvel's gonna charge $5.99, thank you very much, Dan Buckley, jerk uh, for a first issue high expectations should be expected they should be met and even they should be exceeded to keep readers coming back comics are not a charity it's just a business there are no participation trophies unless you're looking at this year's eisner's nominations which is ridiculous uh, but it's on marvel to earn every dollar that they make this first issue needed to hit hard and it needed to hit right where it counts to earn that money so let's talk about the art it's okay but again, pretty much with the writing, there are cracks and unfortunately we just can't look past them. So first of all, I'll give Stegman, Meyer, and Grazia credit for an issue that's bright, it's bold, it's colorful, there's lots of energy going on. So if you're looking for just something to kind of grab your eyeballs just on pure visual sensory input, you're in good shape. But yeah, there are problems. So for example, the Wolverine scene that, met, that we mentioned earlier. We don't know for sure if that's exactly what's going on, that they're harvesting his organs because the coloring is completely purple and blue in a room and it doesn't make sense. You hear, you see things plopping in containers and you don't know what they are because the shapes are amorphous and weird. So visually, there's supposed to be something that's happening on the page, but because of the color choices and the uh, anatomy choices, you don't actually know what you're looking at. And that's not something that should be happening in a 599 comic. Next, uh, Ryan Stegman's character designs, particularly in the faces, are strangely uneven. 
we'll show, we got some examples up on the screen, but there are a sequence of panels, for example, in the beginning with Chief Robbins, where her face looks completely different from one panel to the very next panel to the very next panel. <laughs> in one panel, it's a fully fleshed out face, and in another one, it's overly exaggerated, and in another one, she looks like a Charlie Brown character. I don't know what Stegman is trying to accomplish with that sequence of panels, but it is very strange. Jumping back a little bit into something we mentioned in the beginning of the review, the rescue sequence tries to do too much with not enough space. That's not necessarily a Stegman problem, it's probably a script problem, but it's Stegman's job to kind of make it flow. Unfortunately, in some places, it doesn't flow. For example, and I'll put another example up on the screen, there's a rescue sequence where Quentin and Temper are attacked by a sentinel juggernaut leaps in to save them from getting crushed by a sentinel's hand all good but unless the review copy we got was printed out a sequence or the panels were somehow rearranged in a way that doesn't make any sense that sequence of events for that attack and rescue doesn't make a bit of sense because first quentin and temper are on top then they're below then Sir Juggernaut is under the hand by himself, then he's not, then the Sentinel is there, and then his head is missing, and it all is completely out of order. It doesn't make a bit of sense. That could be the editor just placed the panels out of order, sure. So we'll give Stegman maybe the credit that it's not his fault. But yeah, if that's the way he drew it, it doesn't make a bit of sense. So just like with the writing, we're picking on the art a little bit. I would say, just to be fair, overall the art is bright and eye-catching, but your visual input is, is really getting tripped up here and there and everywhere with little things that are meant to look cool, but doesn't make any sense. Another example, Cyclops does this force beam blast and somehow it ricochets off a wall and then off another Orcus agent and then off another Orcus agent. His force blast doesn't work that way. <laughs> I, I don't know why Stegman did it that way. That's not how force blasts work. I know that sounds like a nerd nitpick, but yeah, that's kind of what we're doing here. Again, for $5.99, you expect high quality. It, this is just strange. Overall, for the let's be honest, for the average casual reader, it's perfectly okay. This issue is perfectly okay if you don't think about it too much. It's fine, but it's flawed. And it's forgettable. If that's okay with you, then you're in good shape. But if you're like everybody else who is a longtime X-Men fan like myself or a longtime Marvel fan, which for a lot of people they are, and you're hoping that the X-Men would get off that stupid orgy island and back to some kind of superhero basics, you get a weirdly paced plot. The art is uneven in spots. The developments in the character work are either strangely off-putting or don't make any sense. And you get a super, super weak villain to kind of kick things off. So final thoughts, what do we think about X-Men number one? The team is now reformed into a new location in Alaska to begin a mission which is save the mutants from Orcus or AIM or any other teams that are still out there hunting mutants down. That's a worthy goal. Sure, we can get on board with that. And plus, getting away from Kakoa is a blessed relief. However, the plot is oddly paced. The art is uneven in spots. The character choices and some of the things that are going on are very bizarre. And the villain is super weak, which is unfortunately becoming a part of Jed McKay's uh, way of writing comics, which is unfortunate. So X-Men number one is not the strong start we wanted for the From the Ashes era. I was hoping for better, and it is what it is. Therefore, we're going to give X-Men number one from Marvel Comics a 6 out of 10. That's probably scoring a little bit high. We're giving it some grace because it is the first issue. Maybe McKay needs to find his legs. Who knows? But still, that's the best it's going to get. Uh, let us know what you think. If you are a Marvel fan, X-Men fan, where it's current era or past era, leave us a thumbs up. Let us know. And if you think I'm off base about this review, leave a comment. Let me know what you think. I want your opinion and I want you to kind of give me some different perspectives after you read this issue. Also, if you're interested in reading the written version of this review, the link is down in the description. So thank you very much for joining and please stay tuned to the outro for the next review.